Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you wherever you are coming in and logging in from. Thank you for attending our first of several speakers who will be presenting this week to celebrate Black History Month and our Black History Month speaker series. Before I introduce you to our guests, let me introduce myself. My name is Reverend Charlotta Green. I am one of the graduate assistants here at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University and our Center for Global Partnerships and Learning. <clears throat> the center provides GSEP students with a myriad of services, ranging from publication support, certificate programs, access to GSEP's academic journal, and a few other services. And it's through the center that we bring you our programming to celebrate this Black History Month um, <clears throat> this year. With that being said, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Clarence Caldwell. Upon waking up in the backseat of a car some years ago to rise from homelessness and poverty to become a senior executive within several large companies, Dr. Caldwell discovered what it takes to be successful and applied those principles to his own career and life. Ironically, some years later, while sitting in the boardroom of a Fortune, 500, a Fortune 100 company, Dr. Caldwell experienced another backseat moment, an inner calling to help others realize their true potential was a voice <clears throat> too loud to be ignored. In addition to teaching ethics, social justice, and personal leadership to doctoral students here at Pepperdine University, Dr. Caldwell coaches and guides other leaders to courageously navigate their careers and lives. Please welcome Dr. Clarence Caldwell with his talk entitled, Cracking the C-Suite Code for Black Leaders. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell, for being here with us. And the next voice you'll hear is Dr. Clarence Caldwell. Thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate uh, the invite to speak. I appreciate being here. I appreciate all that you bring to this subject and everything you're doing to illuminate uh, the whole issue of uh, in Black History Month and, and how important it is. Uh, we'll touch on that. We'll touch on uh, how important it is. I'm just so happy to be here. So thank you. Um, and I, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to be here as well. Everyone that's here, it is that you must know, it is not lost on me that your time is valuable. Your time is precious, your time is valuable. Uh, I often say that uh, uh, time is the most valuable thing that we have and how we invest it will determine our net worth. And so when you're spending time with me here today, I wanna make sure that you're getting all the value that your time deserves. So we were gonna talk through a few things that I am uh, really uh, praying and hoping that you can take with you. Now, logistically, uh, I may go in and out of uh, showing a slide here or there. Uh, for the most part, I want you to see my face. I want you to see my expressions. I want you to see my frowns and my furrowed brow and my smiles and my hand gestures. So I wanna be front and center with you through this talk, however, uh, there are a couple of models that I want to share with you and show you. And so it might get a little clunky as I go back and forth between sharing my screen and not. But the key here is that the message is what matters. And so what I plan to give you today, what you're going to get is a, a few things. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about how to solve the Rubik's Cube. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> I don't know how many of you know how to solve the Rubik's Cube already, but there is a way to solve that Rubik's Cube. And let me tell you about it right now. And the other two things are I'm going to give you the, the, the same uh, uh, solution to your career and to your life. And then finally, I will be giving you a, a how-to plan for your career. Not just what to do, but how to do it. So let's talk about this Rubik's Cube for a second, because when people see it, all jumbled up and the colors are all different sides of the, of, of the cube, it's difficult to understand how to get all the colors lined up. How do we do that? If anybody knows how to do that, please raise your hand and tell me how to do that. You don't need to because I know how. And the answer is simple. Yes, if you can solve the Rubik's Cube, some people think that you're a genius. Some people think that you're gifted, that you're amazing. But it really is simple. But what you need to know 
is the algorithms. There is a combination, a set of algorithms that you must perform no matter what state that cube is in. If you perform those algorithms the same way each time, you will have a solved Rubik's cube. Simple, not so easy because it, there's a, like 150 algorithms you have to memorize and you take it layer by layer. And the bottom layer, of course, is the worst. It's the hardest. So it's not so easy, but it is simple. The simplicity of it is that it's a problem and it has an answer. Well, the same is true with uh, the combinations on the locks that have been shutting you out, shutting you out of the executive ranks in business and corporations, shutting you out of leadership positions, shutting you out of your life's desires, shutting you out of your true potential. There is an algorithm for that as well. This is what I want to show you today. This is what I want to give to you today so that your time, your priceless time, is spent very well. And as I mentioned, the how-to plan. But we're talking about Black history. Let's start there. Let's just start with the issue of history. Now, in school, I don't know what your favorite subject was in school. And here I am giving a, a talk about history, about Black history. So you would think my favorite subject must be history. But that was my worst subject. I did not like history at all. In fact, going to school, it seemed to be the biggest book that I carried around was the history book. It wasn't only the thickest book, but it was the size of the book. It was like, it wasn't an eight and a half by 11, it was 12 by 12. It was the biggest book in my backpack and it was heavy. And I, I just didn't like that class at all. I gravitated toward you know, sciences and, and mathematics, but history, I just did not like it. If you, give, if you have a moment in the chat, tell me what your worst subject was. If you just take a moment to put in the chat what your worst subject was. And uh, the thing about history for me was that chemistry and mathematics, mm, math, history, oh, another history, non-buff. Mathematics, that was the big one for me. I loved mathematics, but I hated history. My history teacher, I went to a school in New York, and it was, um, it was an integrated school. Even when I was growing up, they had integration, believe it or not. Uh, it was a long time ago, but the school literally had two races, two people in it. There were black people and there were Jewish people. That was it. My professor or my teacher at the time for history, his name was uh, Mr. Cohen, I think it was Cohen. Uh, and Mr. Cohen, at the beginning of our semester, when he was teaching us history, he said, okay, students, I know history is not probably your, it's probably not your favorite subject, but I want you to listen very closely. And I want you to learn history. And the reason he said that, he said, I want you to learn it. I want you to know it because I don't want you to make the same mistakes we made. And so history has an importance to it. History is something you have to think a little deeper about. It's not just this happened then. History is about storytelling. It's about the stories that are being told by others who have either a connection to that event or experience, or maybe even uh, experienced it. And they tell stories about it. Stories told about experiences turn into history. It's one of the, um, uh, we're not gonna cover it here, but it's one of the tenets of critical race theory. Uh-oh, he said it, he said the CRT word. Critical race theory is being bantered around within the United States as if it's some bad thing. Critical race theory has five to six components to it. One component to it is called counter storytelling counter storytelling. That is because the history that we learn often does not include the full story. And so when you hear stories from people like me and other people, you now get a more rounded view of what history really was. 
History is necessary. It's a critical part of our growth and our development. History is absolutely necessary. History informs us of our moral obligations. History helps us set our moral compass. History helps us translate the present moment. History acts as a guide for the future. That's how critical history is. See, when we think about history, we think about, oh, that happened then, so what? No, the other side of so what, what happened then is now what? You can say so what if you want, but if you don't understand it, the now what gets a little bit blurry. Um, it was George Santayana who made the statement, you may have heard it said a different way, but his statement was, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That's why history is important. And that's what Mr. Cohen was telling his, us in his class. He says, I want you to listen to me because if you don't understand this, if you don't remember this, you're gonna make the same mistakes we made. History is important. It's my worst subject in school. But as I grew older, as I had life experiences, you heard from the, the introduction, I was homeless, uh, in poverty, sleeping in the backseat of a car, no job, no food, no money, no future. That's a history that I have. That's my life's history. Each of you has a life history. And if you're not learning from that history, you are condemned to repeat it. History is important. It's critical. You know, through my life of getting out of that backseat of the car and ending up in the boardroom of, of some of this country's largest companies, there was a journey of pain, there was a journey of joy. There was a journey of, uh, uh, of hardship, a journey of accomplishment, a journey of excitement, celebration, and a journey of learning. The history of that journey informs me today. It's critical for my growth and development. It informs me today of my own moral obligations. It informs me today of how I set my own moral compass. It helps me translate today's present moment. And it acts as a guide for me for the future. So that's how important history is. You know, I, got, I fell in love with the, the idea of, of epistemology, just knowing, trying to figure out if we know what we know. And history is a part of that. How do we know what we know? How do we think we know what we know? Counter storytelling is a big part of that. So that's why history is important. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you about today, because History is created by leadership. Hmm. I'll say it again. That's actually a tweetable moment. Anybody on Twitter, tweet that one out. History is created by leadership. Think about it for a moment. And if history is created by leadership, then Black history is created through black and ally leadership. So even the dark side of history, even though the, the, the travesties that have taken place are worthy of capturing in history so that we don't repeat the past. So we're not condemned to repeat the past. Black history is important because we don't want to go back to things that were, that were just awful in the days from slavery to Jim Crow, all the way up in America, it was a travesty, but it's important. The stories that are told about those days are important because we don't wanna be condemned to repeat them. But even the dark side of history requires leadership. Why is that? Because if there were not leadership, we wouldn't even know that history existed. Hmm. Let that one settle in for a minute. If it, weren't for if it weren't for leadership, we wouldn't know the history existed. 
There were leaders who were fighting day and day after day to make sure the stories are told, to make sure things turned around, to make sure that this would never happen again. History is important because it informs us of our present moment and it acts as a guide for our future. History requires courageous leadership, not just leadership, courageous leadership. Just think about if there wasn't leadership and there wasn't this history to reflect on. It reminds me of what's going on of late in the state of Texas. I don't know if any of you are from Texas, so don't get offended if I talk about Texas. But they're truly trying to eliminate certain history books, black history books from libraries. What? Banning books from libraries because they're telling the story, the counter story of history that informs us of our moral obligation. It informs us of our present moment. It translates our present moment for us. It sets our moral compass. It acts as a guide for the future. And they want to eliminate those stories. History is important. It's critical. It's necessary. I think about Texas and I, you know, part of me says, if you want to ban something, ban guns, not books. Now, I'm not going to go there because that's not what this talk is about. I'll save that for the, the, the gun rights speech I give later in the year. But right now, we're talking about knowledge. We're talking about history. We're talking about stories and how important it is. But I have to warn you, history and black leadership is not for the faint of heart. There are blood, sweat, and tears that are given, lives are given for the sake of allowing history to unfold, to allow history to be told. Blood, sweat, and tears, literally, lives were given so that you and I, can sit here and talk about that history. We can tell the stories of, uh, uh, of Ruby Bridges uh, who, who had federal marshals marching her to school because there's a crowd uh, uh, of people, white people outside that said they would not allow their kids to go to school with her. We can tell those stories of the freedom marches that Martin Luther King uh, led. We can tell the stories of others who have led the way, who shed blood, who have died, who've had sweat and tears along the journey that created this history. History is critical, history is important. Black history requires courageous leadership. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift to uh, a screen share here so you can see some of these names. And with these names, hopefully, some of them ring true to you. And when we talk about history, many of these names come to mind right away. Let me minimize all of you so that you're not in the way. Anybody ever heard of Frederick Douglass or James Baldwin or Martin Luther King or Harriet Tubman who led slaves to freedom or Rosa Parks Every time I mention one of these names, think about the leadership that was required. Think about the blood, sweat, and tears. Ruby Bridges, I mentioned her. Ida B. Wells, Malcolm X, our good brother, Dr. Cornell West, who's still with us today. I learned so much from Dr. West. Dr. West once told me that uh, I had the privilege of, of, of learning um, under him and uh, going and having him as a professor. And he made a statement that literally shifted things for me. And I'm, I'll make the statement here. It's not as, as accurate and, and as filled with love as, as, uh, uh, as he would have put it. But he said, you have to stand for something. You have to stand up. You have to take a stand. 
I think it was Malcolm X who said, if you don't stand, if you, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So Dr. Cornell West, he, he used the word stand maybe six or seven times in the sentence that he used. And I'm just paraphrasing, stand for something, stand up, take a stand. When you do that, like the people on this list, you become a leader. Leadership is creating the history even as we speak today. What history are you creating? What leadership are you showing? Today, Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth is, um, uh, there's very something very, very important about, uh, about her. She literally met with the president of the United States, black woman, older black woman, met with the president of the United States, who at the time was Abraham Lincoln. At the time the slaves were being freed and the Civil War was beginning, Sojourner Truth met with Abraham Lincoln and encouraged him and even convinced him to allow black men to fight in the Union Army against the Confederates. And he allowed that. There isn't any research that that's done, but it's my opinion that without those black soldiers, the outcome of the Civil War may have been a little different. That without the additional manpower, without that passion, these men were not just fighting for their country, they were fighting for their freedom. Sojourner Truth met with Abraham Lincoln to allow that, to encourage that, to convince the president to allow these black men to fight. So that brings me to the issue of who else is on this list? This list is very, very limited. I threw these names up here so that you would maybe connect with some of them. You may have heard some of these names before, but there are thousands of names that you may not know, that I don't know, that display leadership every moment of their lives. In fighting for justice, social justice, fighting against injustice, fighting to preserve history, fighting to tell the story, history is created through leadership. Black history is created through Black and ally leadership. I'll say it again, again, tweetable. History is created through leadership. Black history is created through Black and ally leadership. Let me give you an example of the ally part of this because it's, it's so important. There was, a, um, there was an organization called SNCC, S-N-C-C. I wonder if I have it here. There it is, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 1960, this group of students traveled the south of the southern part of the United States, ensuring that people would get a chance to vote and that their vote would be counted. One man, one vote is the way it was, was stated then. That took allyship. That took not just black people walking around saying, let us vote, but it took white Americans to say, this isn't right, that voting is being suppressed. We need to have everybody's vote count. Now, understand this, and this is a question that I have um, and I struggle with, and maybe you do too, I don't know. But when we talk about voting, do you know that the 15th Amendment in 1870, was put in place to give black and brown people the right to vote, 1870. We're talking 150, 152 years ago. And in 1960, almost 100 years, 90 years afterwards, they're walking through the Southern states trying to make sure that this issue 
is resolved. And it wasn't until 1965 when the, 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 the Voting Rights Act bill was, was, was signed. And here we are, 2022, and what are we talking about? See, you have to know the stories. This Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, there were, two, there were three gentlemen that went to Mississippi to try to get the vote counted for Black Americans. I get a little choked up when I talk about these guys because they, this is not only leadership, this is allyship and the creation of history is through leadership. Andrew Goodman, James Cheney and Michael Schwerner were killed in the process. They came up missing for a while. Here are their faces. We have to tell the stories. This is what allyship and leadership looks like. But as I mentioned before, leadership is not for the faint of heart. There is blood and sweat and tears. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not showing you, you this to shock you. If you don't already know, know the story, I, I encourage you to read about it. But there are literally tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of stories that match this one. We must tell the stories. History is a part of storytelling. It's the counter storytelling. It's the critical race theory component that allows us and informs us of our moral obligation and acts as a guide for our future. So when we talk about allyship, let me give you a, a, another uh, quick little story, I guess. Um, and this happened just recently. Uh, let me back up here to take the, the, I don't want these faces burned into your memory. Well, maybe they should be. Two weeks ago, um, I taught a class at Pepperdine University and it was a Saturday, Sunday class. So Saturday was 13 hours. The subject for Saturday and Sunday, social justice. Can you imagine having this kind of conversation for 13 hours? Well, there was a lunch break. So let's say 12 hours. It gets intense. There's no way around it. When you tell stories, when you debrief on where everyone is and what people think about where we are and in this point in time and reflect back on history, it's very difficult not to feel something. Here's an example of what happened during that class that, that really, it, it enlightened me tremendously because there was a question that I've had for a long time and I've not known how to solve it. I've not known the algorithm to solve that Rubik's cube, but it's been in the back of my mind for a long time. And two weeks ago, I think it was answered. Part of this discussion that we were having about um, uh, social justice and um, all of the people who've come before and the things that have, that have happened and how we get through it and where we are today and allyship and what does allyship really mean and, and, and all of that, and, and is, is this a, an American problem? Is it a worldwide problem? And let me tell you, the, the, this class that I had, 13 hour class, was filled with people from uh, Africa, Armenia, um, uh, uh, South America, the US. It was a very rich, there were uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, people in this class who, who, who shared their stories. Is that a rich, class or what? I love teaching because I learn every time I teach. And I learned again this, this past class two weeks ago. Because it's 13 hours long, the professor has to find a way to break it up and make it interesting and keep people engaged. So I, I do several things, uh, including uh, one minor thing. It's, it seems minor, but it's so important. And that is uh, a lot of self-care because the subject is so heavy, um, we take time. We take time to breathe. Uh, 
We take time to get water. We take time to do whatever it may, whatever we need to do to get through that long class, that intense class, because it touches you in many different ways. One of the things that I do is I create breakout rooms so that there are three to six people in each breakout room discussing what we just discussed prior, what the lecture was. And they come back with a readout, with a, uh, a display of what it was that they thought about the questions that were asked for the breakout assignment. This one breakout uh, effort took place and this woman who was in San Diego and uh, there were a few other people in that breakout group. One other white male was in another part of California. The woman in San Diego was, was in the middle. Something happened while they were in the breakout. There was an earthquake, California. And the epicenter was right there in San Diego. And so the woman in the middle of their cohort, in the middle of their breakout, she began to scream. Her eyes got big. She ran away from the, from the camera. And no one knew what was going on. No one in her cohort, in her group, knew what was going on. When things calmed down, when the earthquake calmed down a little bit, she came back to the camera. And the white male asked her, well, what, what was that all about? What, are you okay? And she described it was an earthquake. And so the gentleman said, oh. And the first thing he thought about was, is it going to hit here next? He's a, he was close by in California, a different part of California. Is it going to hit here next? And he started to get worried. And he started to feel a little bit anxious. I'm telling you this because that's what he told me. And when he realized that the time had passed and there wasn't an earthquake coming his way, he relaxed. He said, okay, let's keep going. Let's move on. Let's get, let's get this assignment done. Not honoring what this woman had just gone through, but driving ahead with the task. Many of us do that. Just let's just keep moving forward. Let's get this done. Dr. Caldwell is going to be back. He's going to ask us questions. Let's get this moving forward. So when we came back as a, a, a total class, a total group, he shared that story with us because he said, I have to say something. And I said, please go ahead. He said, um, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me using his name. His name is Sean. I said, Brother Sean, tell me what, what's on your mind. And he said, I get it now, Dr. Caldwell. I get it. I said, what do you mean you get it? He says, and he described that whole scene that I described to you of the earthquake. And he said, once I realized it didn't happen to me, I was fine with it. I wanted to just move on. Is that what's happening with racial injustice? I said, Sean, you got it. The hair on my arm stood up when he said it because a light bulb went off for him. He was now understanding that this level of empathy that we think we have for others only goes so far. And if it doesn't happen to you, it's no big deal. Or maybe it is a big deal, but eh, not that big. Allyship requires the awareness and the level of empathy so that you are feeling the tremors of the earthquake that African-American, Black, Latino, people of color in the US feel every day. You must feel those tremors, otherwise, no big deal. Eh, you've come a long way. Get over it. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't work like that. So I tell that story because it happened recently and it informed me of the question that I've always had is how do I get white men to understand what this is all about? Now, Brother Sean said, you know, Dr. Caldwell, I don't live in your skin. I don't experience those tremors every day, every hour. I don't know what that's really like. So I can only be so empathetic. I said, I understand that. I absolutely understand that. 
And I'm not asking you to feel all of my pain. I don't wish that on anyone. But I said, if you can understand that and be aware of that and stand by me, you don't have to even be in the fight with me if you don't, you don't wanna stand next to me, stand behind me, but be aware because I may fall and I need somebody behind me to catch me, have my back. He said, Dr. Caldwell, I have your back. Another goosebump moment. It's important that black and ally leadership create the history that we're producing today. Does that help? I, I, I hope I get, didn't get too far off, off script with that story, but I wanted, to, um, I wanted to share that with you in case it meant something to somebody. With, with the allyship that is important in the US today, and around the globe. The other thing is, was the, uh, uh, the fact that I heard from so many different cultures, the African culture, the Armenian culture, uh, the South American culture, I, I've just, the, the gay and lesbian culture. I heard so much that weekend. It was an intense weekend for everyone, including me. So with, with that knowledge, I began to really equate how does allyship show up in corporate America? You know, we have corporations who, who attempt to be socially conscious. There's this thing called CSR, corporate social responsibility, where companies try to do what's right for the community they serve certainly the customers they serve, but for the communities they serve also. And sometimes it comes over really well and sometimes it lands pretty flat. Um, but if they're trying, uh, let me give you an example of corporate social responsibility. This is a very uh, easy one to understand. There's so many more intricate examples of this, but this one is easy to understand. Uh, Bamba socks, you buy a pair of their socks, they give a pair of socks away to a homeless person or someone who needs socks. That's a CSR program. That's a CSR project that that company has undertaken. Tom Shoes does the same thing. Every pair of shoes, they sell, they give a pair of shoes. So there, there are many different ways to contribute back. Um, there is another one that I will share with you. I'll share my screen again, sorry. I love looking into your eyes, but I want you to see this person's eyes. Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz, his answer or one of his answers to corporate social responsibility is to address this issue of social justice, to address this issue of race. Now, if you know many of the Starbucks stories, one of them had uh, two black gentlemen who were sitting in a Starbucks location having uh, a meeting, but they did not buy any coffee. And the manager of that location called the police to escort them out. They were not dressed any, any different than anyone else, and they weren't causing any disturbance. They were just sitting there having a little meeting. The police were called. They were escorted off the property. So Howard Schultz said, hey, look, we got to understand this thing of race. So everything that's going on, we have to understand this thing. We've got to have conversations about race. So his idea was to have every barista at Starbucks write on the cup. You know how they write your name on the cup? They usually misspell it, but they write your name on the cup. But he wanted them to write hashtag race together. And what he envisioned was that this would just spark a conversation about how the importance of social justice, the importance of race. Now, can you imagine, I don't know if you've been to Starbucks lately, but the, I've been through several and the people that are making my coffee, I don't know why we're 
well, he thought they would be great social justice advocates, um, but he put that on them. They gave them a little bit of training of how to have the conversation, but my word, this was a disaster. A corporate social responsibility project that was intended to do something really, really good for not only the customers, for America, fell flat on its face, beyond flat. It was a total disaster. So this allyship that I'm talking about, Howard Schultz's allyship, I don't, I don't put any, I don't say anything negative about him. He was, he had the intent to do the right thing. He just did it the wrong way, but he didn't know that. And so anyone who, who wants to step up as an ally, you don't have to be in the fight with me. You don't have to stand even side by side, be by my back. So when I fall, you catch me. It's important that we don't demonize allies for doing this kind of thing. And he was, he was demonized for this. It was just a, it was just a wrong thing to do, but he didn't know, he, he tried. So corporate social responsibility is a very good thing, usually. However, like anything else, we make mistakes. Hopefully we learn from our mistakes. Let me move along because I, I think I'm running out of time. When we talk about corporate life, because we have to get to this issue of cracking the C-suite code, the Fortune 500 list came out in the, I believe it was uh, 1954. And since that time, there are only 500 companies that are on that list at any given point in time. But every year, there are those who fall off the list and other companies that come on that list. And over the time, over this period of time, there have been over 2,000 companies on the Fortune 500 list. Of those 2,000 companies, there have been 15 Black leaders. A few, a, a few names um, um, are are actually missing here because there is a company, um, TIAA, the very first African-American male who was assigned a CEO position at TIAA was in 1987. And the next one didn't follow until uh, 12 years later. But uh, the, Sun, the Sunda Duckett is also a TIAA. She's the current CEO. And in between Chilton and the Sunda, there was um, uh, Roger Ferguson, who was an African-American at TEIA. So when I say 15, understand, sometimes we're talking about the same company. It's not 15 different companies necessarily. So there is this disparity here. What is the issue? And it, it, it shows up um, not just in, in corporate America, it shows up in, in sports as well. Do you know that in, in sports, um, there was this idea that black men could not be quarterbacks because they didn't have the intelligence, that blacks could not be coaches because they didn't have the intelligence. And in today's environment, there's less than four black coaches today. There are more black quarterbacks that exist, but this is a, an issue that continues to plague us. It is not something that has gone away. The stories must continue to be told. It is ingrained in the psyche of America that there is a inferiority among black Americans. Mm. And it's ingrained in the conscious, it's ingrained in the psyche, and it's done almost on purpose. I don't wanna say that out loud because, I, 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 but I have evidence. Let me tell, let me give you a, just a, another quick story. I hope you don't mind these stories. I was I was uh, I lived in Virginia, uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, for seven years. And when I first arrived, 
Um, I was talking to someone about the Civil War and he reminded me it wasn't the Civil War uh, and I was confused and he called it the War of Northern Aggression. So I realized that they hadn't quite gotten over this. This was in 2001. But when I looked at the newscast every day, I was noticing something that just seemed to be the case and I wasn't sure, but every time there was a crime committed and they had the perpetrator's face on the screen, if it was a white perpetrator, the face would be up there a certain period of time. And if it was a black perpetrator, the face would be up there much longer. And I said, that can't be the case. So I literally took a pad, pencil, kept it by the TV. And when I watched the news, the local affiliate, I would capture the timing. And over almost a two week period, I looked at it and the average time that a white perpetrator's face was shown was five to 10 seconds. The average time for a black perpetrator's face to be shown was 20 to 45 seconds as the commentator would talk while the face was being shown. So when we talk about institutional or systemic or societal racism, sometimes we're being programmed. Can you imagine living in Virginia and watching the news every day and seeing those images every day, every month, every year, year after year? After a certain period of time, you begin to believe that all crime is being perpetrated by black people. We have to tell the stories. You know, there was a time when America, black uh, Americans were not considered human. Leads us to uh, the Tuskegee Institute uh, experiments because blacks don't feel pain the, right, the, the same way. It, it accounts for some of the mistrust in the medical system today that, the black, that black people have. Blacks are considered a physical threat. There was a study by, um, uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson and Hunberg that, and Rule, who, who studied the, the uh, they took two males, white and black, same size, same weight, same build, same everything, and their research showed uh, the people that saw these men considered the black man bigger and more of a physical threat. That's not something that people want to believe, but it's ingrained, it's in the psyche of America, it's in the psyche of Americans, and it really permeates through our country, our institutions, et cetera. Let me keep moving quicker because uh, I really only have a few minutes left. All right, so let's, this is the timeline of those CEOs and when they were, uh, when they were assigned the CEO position of those Fortune 500 companies. Okay, let's get to cracking this code. How do we get to that next level of leadership within corporations? This is something I created. It's called the PREP C model, the PREP C leadership model. It's kind of a play on words because we're preparing leaders for the C suite. Now, the C suite is, for those of you who are not familiar with corporate lingo, it's like the top floor of a fancy hotel where you have the whole floor rented out and you get, um, you know, you don't even have room service. You have a chef up there and you have your own private elevator that takes you to that room. And the room does, and the elevator doesn't open up into the hallway. It opens up into the room. I mean, it is the fanciest room in the hotel. You have a view of the entire city or countryside. It is the top level. The C-suite, that's the president's suite. The C-suite in corporations is very similar. Those are the executives who hold titles such as CEO, Chief Executive Officer, CMO, Chief Marketing Officer, CTO, Chief Technical Officer, COO, Chief Operating Officer. So if you have a chief in front of your name, you're in the C-suite. So how do we get black men to permeate or black women, black leaders to permeate or leaders of color to permeate that C-suite, to break through, to crack the code, how do you get there? Well, as you can see around this circle, there are all these things that seem to be barriers. The institutional racism that I talked about, that's in the psyche of, a, of, the, US, of the American mind, discrimination, bias, stereotypes, microaggression, racial subordination, all of these things 
are there supposedly preventing black leaders from getting to the highest levels in corporations. But let me just give you the tactics that are required. First of all, if you're wanting to move up in any organization, it doesn't have to be a, a Fortune 500 company, you have to have a presence. Your personal brand must say something about you. What does your image say? How do you communicate? Presence is everything. Do you have that executive presence already? Don't wait till you become a, a, an executive to have the, the executive presence. The presence must be there so that they know you're ready to be in that C-suite. Communication is important. I know some uh, black men who, when they ask a question, that's how they do it, ask, instead of ask a question. Ask a question, it's not spelled A-X, but just the simple communication is about your presence, how you type it, an email. Lots of typos in there. What, 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 do you, what do your emails look like? Get them proofread. <laughs> your presence is everything. Relationships, building relationships is, is another uh, important aspect of the PREP model. Do you see how we're using the acronym P-R-E-P-C? -P -P we'll get to the others. Relationships are important. You must have great sponsors, great mentors, someone who's got your back when it's time for you to be considered for that next level. Mentors and sponsors are important. You must have diverse support. It can't be all white men who are your mentors and sponsors. It can't be all black men who are your mentors and sponsors. They can't be all financial gurus. Get an operational guru, get a financial guru, get someone who understands marketing as a mentor or sponsor. I call it your board of directors. Have, build a board of directors and build those relationships so that they can talk for you when you're not in the room. Because it's not what they say about you when you're in the room, it's what they say when you're not in the room. Education, education is so important. That's one of the reasons we're all here. We're getting educated on this. Now, part of it is formal education. You must have a level of education so people, uh, for some reason, that holds so much more weight than, than your uh, PhD in living <laughs> in life. Uh, but when you're talking about companies and corporations, if you really wanna break through to that C-suite, you've gotta have that formal education, but it's not just that. Education is ongoing. It requires you to stay abreast of what's going on in the industry, in your industry. Politics, here I'm talking about corporate politics. You have to know where the landmines are. You've got to align yourself with the power within a corporation so that you know that the politics won't be your demise. And that's a dangerous thing to do. It's a hard thing to do, but it has to be done. And then finally for the PREP C model is your contribution. That's not just your performance, but it's how you are performing and how you are contributing to the bottom line. Uh, when, uh, one of my first management positions, I had a, a boss who gave me my annual evaluation. And my annual evaluation, I thought I knocked it out of the park that year. And I thought, I've got to get an outstanding. There were only four scores you could get, outstanding, uh, uh, satisfactory, um, uh, or unsatisfactory, um, or you're on a performance plan. You're out the door. Um, I sat down with my manager, then manager, and as he shared the evaluation with me, he said, you're unsatisfactory. It blew me away. I didn't know what to say or what to do. And so I said, Carl, that's his name. I'm gonna call him out. <laughs> I don't agree with this, but if that's how you see me, that's how you see me. What can I do to do better next year? Uh, empowering statement, right? Carl looked me dead in my eyes. And my mom used to tell me, always look a man in his eyes. So I looked him right back in the eyes to get the answer. And he said, Clarence, there's nothing you can do. Okay. Now we're talking about that outer ring, <laughs> right? So uh, know that this is not where we should focus, however. That outer ring can be taken care of through policies and laws and rules. That's not for us to do. A black man should not focus there. The critical sequence for the black man is to begin in the center. And in the center is not discrimination, institutional racism. Yes, we must know all about that. But the real issue is starting with who you are. 
you must start with a solid mindset. Now I'm going to go through this next part very quickly, and I'll join you back for face-to-face -face here for questions. So when we talk about mindset, there's this, I'll call it a great book that's out. It's called Escape from Average. And Escape from Average goes through five immutable laws to rise and lead. And it's all about personal leadership. And these five laws have served me well from getting from the bread line to the boardroom, let's say. The first is the law of choice, the choices you make. It's really about your emotional intelligence. Are you in touch with who you are that way? So that the choices you make make a lot of sense to what you're trying to accomplish. The second one is your commitment. How committed are you to the choices you make? Do you have the will and the desire? Is your why big enough to give you that will and desire, to give you that level of commitment? The third is the law of courage. We have a lot of fears. We fear failure. We fear rejection. We fear embarrassment. We fear criticism. I'm not going to speak up in that meeting because they might criticize me. If you have those fears and you don't have the courage to get through those fears, you are doing yourself and others a disservice. The fourth law is the law of confidence. Confidence is a tricky thing. It's built on your competence. Yes, you must know what you're doing, but it's also built on your self-belief. How much belief do you have in yourself, even if you're competent? And then the fifth law, the law of celebration. I call it the law of celebration because that's when you really pop the champagne bottles, you pat yourself on the back, you say, yes, I've made it, I've done everything. You give yourself the accolades, the kudos, everybody says congratulations, but it is more. Once you have gotten there, there was a gentleman who, who, who I worked for, he was a black vice president. He said, Clarence, when you get to the next level, you have one job, and that is to turn around, reach down and pull someone else up. So part of the law of celebration is yes, pat yourself on the back, but also give. Give without the expectation of reciprocity. Let me say it more simply. My neighbor, I said that to my neighbor once and he said, what are you talking about? And I explained it he said, oh, you mean give with no strings attached? Oh, okay, yeah, give with no strings attached. Give without the expectation, expectation of reciprocity. Just give, give from the heart, give with gratitude. When you do these five things, when you have these five laws permeating through you as a leader, it's not your title that entitles you. It's what you do, how you work for others that makes you a great leader. I'm gonna stop here because I think we're at the top of the hour. Um, and I, I apologize uh, <laughs> if we've gone uh, a little bit long, but I, want, I, I do wanna entertain questions if there are questions that people might have. So the floor is open. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell, for um, an amazing presentation with lots of really good wisdom um, to kind of digest. So are there questions? What different leadership style can we approach when we deal with groups? Hold on. Um, that are all, all black, mixed race, or all white? Yeah, so talking about approach. Okay. yeah, that's a great, great question, because there are so many different leadership styles, right? You've got your everything from your uh, transactional leader, your liaison fair, your transformational leader. There, it, you can get confused on the, on the grid on whether you're a one nine manager or a one one manager. I mean, there's so many different ways to, to slice your leadership. Let, let me just try to simplify it, because all of those are important to understand. But when you're dealing with people. You, you start from inside, okay? You start from that emotional intelligence. One, number one, uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Goldman, who is an alum of Pepperdine actually, has these five things he talks about in emotional intelligence. One, be self-aware. You gotta be aware of yourself first. So yes, as you're identifying that you've got a group of black people or a group of white people or a mixed group, that's okay. But who are you in this, in this process, right? Self-aware. Secondly, self-regulation. I'm aware that I don't understand this whole issue of racial, social justice. So how am I gonna regulate my conversation around it? I can't just go out there and blurt stuff out. I can't just write on a coffee cup, race together, cause I'm, you know, I'm woke 
No, you have to really understand yourself and regulate yourself in a way that fits with the, the cohort that you're, you're managing or the, uh, the group that you're managing. Uh, the, the third piece of, of Goldman's five points is uh, empathy. We talked a little bit about empathy earlier. What level of empathy you have may only, it can only go so high because you're not in the skin of other people, but being aware that you don't have the full empathy, you ask questions. You say, hey, look, is this all right? In, in, our, in our class that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a, a, an ally, a woman, uh, Armenian. She said, she said I, um, I, I wanna say something to my African-American friends, but I'm not sure that's the word I should use. African-American, should I use black? Should I use, so she was asking the question, how do I address people of color, black people? And so we had this big conversation about the names. I will tell you something very uh, transparently. Black people don't even know how to call each other by their name. We've been called colored, Negro, Negra, Nigger, Black, African-American. We've been called everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. So if you're confused, guess what? We are too. Mm -hmm. So, so, so my, my short answer, I'm sorry for the long answer. My short answer to your question is be empathetic. Be aware, use the leadership that is, fits at that moment. Now, there are times to be transactional. There are times to be transformational. If, I'm, if, if this building is burning, I don't want someone that says, oh, how do you feel about this building burning, Dr. Caldwell? I want somebody that says, get out the back door right now. That's the person I want to take in charge. Right. It depends on the situation. It depends on who you are at the time and who you're leading. So it's it's not a black or white, forgive the pun, answer, but it is something that you have to really be in connection with yourself about uh, before you can really be who you're meant to be in front of that group. Any other questions? I'm not saying any. There is another one um, by Pranshu. Oh, sorry, my camera is not there. Okay, by um, Pranshu, according to you, sir, what kind of leaders does contemporary society demand? Now, just a quick uh, note, we are over time. It is 6.04 p.m. Um, we can stay on for another couple of minutes or um, I would love for you all to um, get in touch with Dr. Clarence. Um, you can you can get in touch with him as well um, on LinkedIn and connect with him there. And he is he is here at Pepperdine. You can email him here at Pepperdine as well. Um, we do have a link to a form we would love for you to fill out. So let me uh, grab that link. Give me one second here. And um, in the meantime, if you can answer. I'll read that question for you and yeah. then you can go ahead and do that. According to you, sir, what kind of leaders does contemporary society demand? Um, I, you know, again, it's, it's one of those, I don't, I don't want to use the, the uh, cliche or the overused term of situational leadership, but every situation requires a different leader. So the, the type of leadership that is required is, some, is an open, honest, understanding leader that knows what they should do in the moment. And that, I don't know if that has a name to it. So I, I try not to label leadership styles so much, although we learn about it. I even teach about it. Uh, so I know they exist, but I, do, uh, I don't want to get locked in on a label because that really, it limits you. It limits you from being truly you. And the, the true leadership style is one that starts with your personal leadership. It starts within. Those things I just talked about, your emotional intelligence, your choices, your commitment, your courage, your confidence, your celebration, all of those things are your personal leadership. And if you, you must start there. When you start there, now you have the, the tools and the capability of being the right leader at the right time. Personal leadership must precede professional leadership. Mm, that's, a, that's a word right there. That's an important <laughs> word for us to hold on to, particularly when we, yes. we focus so much on what kind of, what style of leadership or what kind of leader, um, and we never tell people to start where they are in that, that special 
um, self-aware, empathetic. I, I see you. I see the community. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes. thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we are at time. And I want to um, make sure that um, we give you some announcements about our next set of speakers that are coming up. And so I'm going to say thank you once again to Dr. Card- um, Caldwell. You gave us amazing nuggets. Thank Amazing. You very much. So I hope and um, that all the people that were here got something that they needed for the particular areas that they are in and will uh, dig in and use this. So um, if you'll give your attention back to uh, my colleague, Dr. Asia, um, she will tell you a little bit more about the rest of the month and our speakers. Absolutely. So um, as you can see from the screen that I have shared, um, I would like to be able to have you all uh, just take a quick look tomorrow at five o'clock p.m. Pacific time here in LA. And for those of you in other parts of the world, um, it will definitely be either morning or late in the evening. Um, We have Black History, Things I've Learned Along the Way, which will be discussed by Dr. Donta Morrison. And he will cover the importance of Black history, not only as a month, but also as an ongoing educational tool. So he will be on tomorrow, Tuesday, February 8th at five o'clock p.m. Pacific time, Los Angeles time, eight o'clock Eastern. You can register in the link that I sent in the chat. So if you go ahead and click that link, that'd be great. Um, Also, we would love for you to to go ahead and fill out um, the form that I sent you. Uh, That form gives us some feedback, lets us know how we're doing with these um, events that we're doing, we're bringing on for all of you. And on Wednesday, February 9th this week at three o'clock p.m. Pacific, we will have Dr. Jayani Sly, um, one of our recent graduates of Pepperdine and current PhD student. She will be talking about Black Educators Matter. Again, uh, you can sign up for her talk in her session following the link I sent in the email, I'm sorry, in the chat. Um, we would love for you to be on and for you to be able to see um, these next two events coming up this week. Also next week, we've got a couple more speakers. We have um, Asia Rubieska Heaton, another one of our Pepperdine alums, um, and she will be speaking on leadership confidence, how to survive being the first and only. Uh, this one is going to be next Tuesday, February 15 at five o'clock. Again, you can go ahead and you can register for that, five o'clock Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern. And then finally, we have Um, Next Wednesday, February 16, we have Dr. LaShonda Johnson, who will be talking about Black Women Leaders Matter, Keys to Success for Black Women Leaders in Higher Education. Um, Again, this is at 5 o'clock Pacific, 8 o'clock Eastern. Um, Please sign up for all of these. And in the next week, we will also have our Dean, Dean Williams, who will be doing our keynote for us on the 24th. And of course, I'm confirming that. And so as soon as I do, you will hear about that as well. Uh, With that said, thank you so much, Dr. Caldwell, for coming on today and for giving us such great information and insight. I I enjoy listening to you and everybody I know enjoyed it so much. I I could see the responses. So um, I just, I'm really, really just glad that you were here today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, We wish you all a wonderful and blessed evening. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night or a good morning or a good afternoon, wherever you're at, wherever you are.